Simon. Hello. Hey, Simon. <laughs> Hello. Hey, Simon. Simon. It's Skylar. How hey, you Simon. Hello, Simon. What's up, Simon? Hello. How you doing? Hey. Hello. Hey there. Simon. Simon. Hello, Simon. Hello, Simon. <laughs> this is Conversations with Storytellers, a podcast of wisdom, thoughts, and folk and fairy tales from our elders. And I am your host, Simon Brooks, a meeting with professional storytellers. This episode contains some very graphic detail regarding slavery. Some of this will be triggering and upsetting. Antonio Hosha, who I am in conversation with, is of African and Portuguese heritage. Where it gets really bad, I have added another warning. I am very fortunate to say that Antonio Hosha and I are good friends. We both tell folk and fairy tales, and Antonio also tells a number of personal stories which are both funny and poignant. He also spent the beginning of COVID creating an historical piece on a ship which became a slave ship called the Malaga. This true story is woven into Antonio's life. As the ship was built in Maine, where Antonio now lives, and travelled to Brazil, where Antonio was born and raised. This was one of the most enlightening and hardest conversations I have had on this series so far. The interview, taking place in Antonio's living room, talks about the slave trade and how Antonio came to creating the story of the slave ship Malaga. This is a deep conversation and tackles some hard facts and some might find this episode, as I have already mentioned, triggering and upsetting. Welcome, Antonio Hosher. I'm sitting in a living room in Grey, Maine, which is about half an hour's drive from Portland on the coast. And the house that I'm sitting in belongs to Antonio Hosher. Now, Antonio comes from Brazil, one of the hottest places on the planet, but he has made his home here in Maine, United States of America, one of the coldest places. That's right. <laughs> and we're here today to talk about um, a production, not really, a, pro a story, a true story, an historical story about a ship called Malaga. That's right. And it's a slave ship. Yes, it was used in various um, ways and then it found itself in the slave trade. Right. Yeah. Um, the ship was built in 1832. Okay. Just about 40 minutes from here. Well, 45 minutes. Um, in uh, off of a town called Brunswick. Okay. And um, so the ship was built in 1832, and slavery was still legal. Right. So the ship was used right away to haul uh, products that were created by the slave um, industry. Right. So sugar and Sugar, coffee. tobacco. Co um, um, well, it started with sugar. Right. The whole slave th thing started with sugar. Mm -hmm. uh, sugar was a very um, um, expensive commodity. Right. You know, in the 1400s, just to give a, a perspective, in the 1400s, this is before the American slavery started, right? right? Um, a human being uh, consumed in six months the amount of sugar it's in a soda can today. Wow. <laughs> so it took them six months to, to consume the amount the of sugar, sugar we drink in five minutes, right? Yeah, if um, not, right, yeah. You know, then they brought the sugar plantations, they started the sugar plantations and they tried with with the natives. Right. But the natives could escape and go hide. Right. Right? Um because they knew the land. Right. Very well. Uh this is just one of the details. This is not the detail, but um right. Yeah, and, and not to, to uh, under Mine, you know, the natives would, would escape, right? They tried slavery with the slave, with the native first, but they would escape, but they're still obliterated. In Brazil, for example, when the Portuguese arrived there in 1500, mm -hmm. and this is stuff that I learned, this is information I, I learned 
reading Laurentino Gomi's Slavery. It's called the, the, his thrilo- uh, trilogy is called Slavery. There are about three to four million natives in what is known as Brazil today when the Portuguese arrived there. Mm-hmm. Okay. The first account of slavery was actually a ship that left Brazil in 1511 for Portugal with, uh, with, uh, with jaguar skins, parrots, Brazil wood, mm-hmm. and a group of natives who were auctioned off into slavery in Portugal. Okay. So that's the first registered uh, transatlantic shipment of slaves was actually from Brazil to Portugal with natives. And then they, when they started to bring in the Africans, they kept on killing Native Americans, Native Brazilians. You know, they're Native Americans because it's all the Americas, right? Mm-hmm. And um, it was about a million per century. A million per century. Holy so in 300 years, okay, you can understand how, how the population dropped down from 3 to 4 million in 300 years, it dropped down to about 700,000, okay? And, of, of um, native and, and, and yes, native South Americans in, in what is called Brazil. And the majority of the death was caused by disease. It was caused by weapon and, and warfare as mm-hmm. well. Right. But most of it was disease that the Europeans brought that was not known, you know, to, to, South, to, to the natives. Right. So one million per century, wow. one million indigenous each a hundred years. Uh, so, yeah. So it was genocide on all f- yeah. fronts. Yeah, on all fronts. And then they start to bring in Africans and strip them of their culture, of their names, and isolate them f- from everything they knew mm-hmm. as a way of. It was really like a you know, warfare type of tactics, you know, strip right. of your identity and build a new one. And so Malaga was created in 1832. So it was already illegal to bring, to traffic humans from Africa to the Americas. Brazil continued okay. the trafficking and it was illegal to transport them, but there was always a way around right. it, right. Uh, because um, the eighteen hundreds, which was the last century, that last period of the last push, slavery was the number one industry in the world. Holy cow! In the eighteen hundreds, wow. Brazil's number one crop in the eighteen hundreds was coffee. Right. So Brazil was exporting coffee and importing slave ships. And slave ships, since it was already illegal Mm -hmm. to build them, they were any ship that you could get a hold of became a slave ship. So Malaga was not a big ship at all. It was only 183 tons. It was an 183 ton brig. Mm -hmm. You know, Amistad was also not a very big ship. You know, Amistad came to Portland a long time ago, it was either Amistad, the ship itself, or a a lookalike, something like that. But I looked at it, I was like, wow, that's a small ship. You know, you think you're going to look at something huge. Huge. But but, uh, they were trying to get a hold of anything uh, because it was prohibited, but the slavery was still going on in the Americas. Right. Right? This is the early 1800s. Right. So anybody who built ships, those ships ended up almost thousands of ships were used in the legal trade in the 1800s. So, and, and nobody wanted to give away the number one industry. It was the number one. This is not something I'm making it up. I'm not right. exaggerating it. This is a historical fact. In the 1800s, slavery was the number one industry and it supplied, it was the tip of the iceberg of many other industries insurance boat building 
water supply, water resupply, uh, um, maintenance, um, you name it, you know, it was... Uh, it touched a lot of places. It touched many Everything. other industries, yeah, right? right. Um, so Malaga came to me four years ago, and um, it was Daniel Minter. Daniel Minter is a stellar visual artist, and he is the artistic director of the Indigo Arts Alliance. Okay. In well, Portland. Okay. All right. It's an arts alliance that promotes and supports uh, uh, black and brown art in Maine. Okay. And, and it's located in Portland, Maine. So he knew of my storytelling. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting how this story came because for many years I've been wanting to tell a ship story. One day I woke up and I'm like, I don't tell any story about ships. I have stories about flying. I have stories about trains. I'm like, how about a nice ship? Because with my mind background, mm -hmm. it's like really fun to do a ship, you know, moving across oceans and, and wind and this and that. And I'm like, it's a great movement, mime-oriented um, object, you know, the, the, the ship itself. Right. But I didn't want to, the, the thought of creating a slave ship story uh, uh, and tell it, it never crossed my mind because it was a subject matter that I was always avoiding. You know, it's part of my heritage. You know? right. um, I am part European and part African in heritage, born and raised in Brazil. But, um, but I have Portuguese, Swiss, German blood from my mother's side right. and African from my father's side. So, um, but I've always been nervous about the story, uh, uh, talking about slavery. And I've always told myself, you, just by being on stage, you, di you bring in enough diversity. You don't need to talk about slavery. Just, you know, other people are doing a great job with it. Just let it be. Uh, but uh, it, that was myself trying to pacify a fear I had right. of the subject. Okay. I had no idea where I came from in Africa. There's, you know, because the history was erased. You arrived in the Americas as a black person. You know, they, they cut your hair. They, they put the slave owner's name as your surname, right? right? as your yeah. last name. So my Vieira, it's a Portuguese name. My father was Vieira. Vieira is not an African name. It's a Portuguese name. Right, right. Um, so there was always this fog. I was this black cloud. And then one, and I'm like, I want to do a ship story. Maybe there's a fun pirate story I can tell. Yeah, yeah, right. I even thought that. <laughs> I even thought about that. That's, yeah. how, that's how I was blocking it. Yeah. And then Daniel mm -hmm. Minter said, hey, have you heard that a lot of the ships built in Maine ended up in the slave trade? I'm like, no. It's like there's one in particular that goes to Brazil called the Malaga ship. And, you know, I... I and he goes, you know, I think it would be something for you to look into. And I'm like, really? There's a slave ship called Malaga that goes to Brazil? He goes, oh. yeah. And he goes, talk to Kate McMahon. Kate McMahon is a scholar from Maine who works for the Smithsonian uh, Museum of African American Culture. Okay. Um, history and Culture. Okay. It's the oldest, the, the newest museum. Okay. All right. Uh, in the in the mall there in DC, and um, so I I connected with her. We did a Zoom four years ago. If it was Zoom, it was already during COVID. Okay. Because I started to use Zoom only after that first year of COVID. Oh, I started. Okay. Using, so if I did a Zoom with Kate, it was 2020, mm -hmm. because the the story was premiered in 2021. So it was so 20. You, you didn't spend much. That was quick. Well, it was a year. Right. Um, but thanks to her, because what she did is we did the Zoom. Right. And she told me more or less the story of the ship. There's actually the Malaga ship. There's the porpoise that came out of the same shipyard that went to Brazil as well. A lot of ships went to Brazil for me. Okay. There is actually an American company called Wright & Company. Wright with a W. Wright & Company. Mm -hmm. They would import coffee and supply ships to Brazil in the 1800s. They were brokers. 
Okay. Right. Um, so, so she tells me, and she goes, and I did a whole PhD thesis on this, on the New England involvement mm -hmm. in slavery. Wow. Uh, and she said, I will send you the PDF of my uh, dissertation. Use it as you please. Ooh, that's nice. Amazing. That's a Kate, huge source. Kate was amazing. Um, so I go through her PhD dissertation. And it was good because it gave me the time frame, okay. right? Malaga is built 1832, starts sailing on the East Coast, shipping products made by slavery, right? Right. The cottons of the South kept the looms of the North moving, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it's, yeah. You see what I mean? Everybody benefited from it. It was yeah. the status quo. Right. It was the biggest industry right. uh, um, for that last century especially. So long story short, Kate gives me the PhD thesis. I read, I, I get the dates, I get the names, you know, the trafficker in Brazil that, that refitted Malaga to start bringing slaves to Brazil illegally. Right. A man called uh, Manuel Pinto da Fonseca, that's Portuguese, Manuel, basically, um, it's a very common name in Portugal. My grandfather, my maternal grandfather was called Manuel. Okay. I have a cousin called Manuel. Um, and Fonseca is the name of a neighborhood I, I lived for four years in Brazil, in Rio. So, so the, then I started to see the personal in the historical, right? So the name of your, the area that you, you spent four years of your life in, was it named after the no, but it's named after the, it's it's a big family, right? Okay. But I saw that as 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 a huge coincidence, right? And you a know, connection. it's it's like oh my goodness, the guy who who um, chartered Malaga for this nitty gritty work, right? His last name is the name of a neighborhood I lived. Malaga sails into Rio, a place where I grew up. I'm from Brazil. I came to Maine. Maine uh, Malaga is from Maine. Went to Brazil. So I started to see this crossroads of coincidences right. of our trajectory. And Malaga comes from the woods of Maine, from the interior, and it's sold into the slave trade. The slaves came from the interior. Some of them, towards the end, they were coming from the interior of Africa sold into the slave so there are all these parallels going on and i said my goodness this is not just a historical story it's a personal story as well as luck has it uh as i am reading her phd i am getting acquainted with this man called laurentino gomes he's a brazilian author mm -hmm. bestseller of three historical books on brazilian history and then i'm watching his interviews online in Portuguese and um, and he he said I wrote three books about Brazilian history and they became bestsellers he got a, a slew of awards for how he wrote the story you know the, the his narrative is it's so like you, you have a hard time putting the book down yeah okay. it's, you know being a journalist he said that's what I wanted people to not be able to put the book down so he designed the story. He didn't change history, but he tells it in a way that you, you have a hard time putting the book down. Right. It's not like listening to a history lecture. No, like, no, blah, no, blah, no. Blah, he blah, puts blah. in a lot of interesting details um, and um, stuff that you, I never knew about. But I did not read these three bestsellers. I'm listening to him. Mm -hmm. And he says, I cannot write three bestsellers about um, uh, Brazilian history without dedicating three more volumes on slavery alone. Wow. And I'm like, whoa. So he he was publishing one book per year on slavery. They're like thick books, like 500 pages. Wow, okay. Plus right. books on, on, on starting with a general idea of how it started and then focusing on Brazil because Brazil uh, had almost half of the slaves went to Brazil in those 350 years. From Africa. From Africa almost half goes there 4.9 million 
So, um, so I'm like, I'm reading these books now. Uh-huh. I'm reading his books, and and it's giving me details about the Middle Passage. It's giving me details that I've never could have imagined such as the sharks changing their behavior across the Atlantic to follow the ships because so many bodies were thrown overboard that the sharks changed their their migratory uh, behavior across the Atlantic and start to follow these slave ships. So, yeah, that's, that's nuts. Yeah. And, um, it was an average of 12 in the 300 if you divide the number of people that were thrown overboard right. in 350 years, it was about 12 to 15 a day. You know, uh, it's it's and then I uh, and so so I had Kate's PhD give me the dates, right, and some very important information about stops where the boat went and stuff, right. And then I had Laura Chindo Gomez's books giving me details about the Middle Passage about Rio. Rio was the largest slave city in the Americas in the 1800s. Rio de Janeiro has a population, we say Rio de Janeiro. Portuguese, you know, we pronounce it Rio de Janeiro. Okay. Uh, But with the American, Americans say Rio de Janeiro, right? right? Um, So Rio had a population in the in 1849, Rio had a population of 206, okay. give and take, right. thousand people. Right. 206,000 people. And from those 206, 80,000 or so were slaves. Wow, that's nuts. It was the largest uh, slave city in the Americas. And they were uh, doing all very, you know, very uh, different types of jobs. Right. Uh, all the way from nursing white babies and taking care of household, you know, and the ladies and, and carrying their things. Um, you could rent a slave. For example, if you lived in Rio as a white person, mm-hmm. and but you didn't own slaves, okay? You just have a house and you're a bachelor, mm-hmm. but you wanted to go to the theater and you wanted to look good. Oh. You could rent two or three slaves and have an entourage of servants go to the theater with you because that made you look good. That's bonkers. That's crazy. Okay? So you could do that. Yeah. There are slaves called tigers. They are nicknamed tigers, not because of their fierce strength, uh-huh. but because their black hue was discolored in stripes. They were gray. They were gray stripes on their backs and arms. You know, a lot of these men walked around, uh, you know, shirtless, right? They're, okay. So they would, um, they had stripes. So their blackness was gone in that area. It was grayish stripes because they were the carriers of urine and feces from their masters. And they would carry these barrels filled to the brim and the, and the waste would, Oh, pour man. down the barrels and gosh. down their backs. Oh, my so I'm reading his books, and I'm like, "Oh my gosh, nobody taught, taught us this in in, in, in school." Yeah, right. You know, you know, um, you know. They said that it was a a good thing for the Africans to be brought to the New World because they're savages. Now oh. they're going to learn how to be people. They're not savages. No. These people are like most of them were teenagers, by the way. Okay. Most of the slaves right, right, right. were because, teenagers. Because they were kids. They make more money because they yeah, were they're young strong. And strong. Exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a really expensive slave was a twelve year old boy, twelve, thirteen year old lad. Right? Because they would grow up to be big and strong. Yeah. So you had the longest. Because you could work them. Right, yeah, because yeah. people didn't live to be sixty years old. Right. Back in the seventeen, eighteen hundreds. Right. So a strong person was a teenager. So first of all, they are not grown men and women, they're teenagers. Uh, they are the sons and daughters of builders, architects, um, people who could make gold coins in Africa out of gold. They knew how to mine. They knew how to take care of cattle. They knew how to uh, plant and, and harvest rice. Right. 
and they had a lot of know-how. They're not savages. Right. Many of uh, some of them were actually as punishment sold by African kings into slavery. That's nuts. Yeah, yeah. As well, everybody was involved. It was it was the status quo. Was slavery uh, in Brazil? Some black people who were freed right. from slavery right. and became, you know, because in Brazil there's um, a lot of um, uh, a lot of slaves were freed over right. the course of you know if they did something a certain way for so many years they could get points towards their freedom. Okay, because there are a lot of slaves coming in and they needed the young and the strong. So when you are getting to a certain age, they would work it out. Um, certain laws, okay. Uh, uh, certain points you could get towards a free. So some slaves, some people, uh, some black folks, who got to be somebody, quote unquote, right, and got to make some money. They sometimes buy slaves. That's that's. So there are black people in Brazil owning slaves. So ex -slaves. not a lot of people, but <clears throat> right. But there were some, ex slaves who were buying slaves. Yeah, because it made them look good. Because it was so, in, and and um, and then there's this whole slew of of uh, you not looking good. There's a stigma for being black. Okay. So perhaps by owning black people, you are less black. Before, okay. all right. I there's a, that. there's a huge oh, yeah. psychological, um, literally like it's almost like warfare, uh, psychological warfare, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. going on, that being black was so bad that you wanted to be, look like a white person. So somebody who was freed, they, 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 they would try to, to look as less black, even though they were black, right? right? right, right. Um, there was a whole movement of people marrying white, people okay uh because they didn't want to look bad right a and then the pr and then the and then that goes it even into black people having prejudice over black people okay yeah 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 because it's like you remind me of something i don't want to be reminded of so I, therefore i don't want to deal with you yeah okay so there's this it, it's, so it's very so, complicated yeah, it is. but i'm going off i'm going off uh on a tangent here uh, um, talking more about the history of overall history, but Malaga exists for 15 years. Malaga is right. born, and I tell the story from her point of view. She's the main character of the story. Right. So Malaga is sunk, actually. Malaga is shot and sunk, eventually, by the British. Huzzah! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because the but, British um, were funny. Uh, at the time, the Industrial Revolution... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, well, let me rephrase that. Uh, the British had a very in, they had they were playing two roles. Okay, they were importing goods from the Americas to supply the Industrial Revolution in England. Right. So, and, and cotton, anything was going there. Right. right. Then uh, they were patrolling to make sure nobody was trafficking slaves slaves in the 1800s. Right. But at the same time, they are patrolling. They're also importing stuff made, produced by the slaves. slaves right, yeah. <laughs> so there's this, it's, you know. The dichotomy. Uh, yes. Yeah, the, contradiction. Uh, yeah, toma cada la. You know, there's this expression in Portuguese it's called toma cada la. It's like, give me some, take some. Toma ca, right. take some. Da la means give some. So toma cada la, it's like, okay, I'll keep a blind eye this way. And you keep a blind eye that way, you know, and... Uh, and it will change the flag. So a lot of the slave ships had American flags. That's right. You told me that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Because the Americans were not trafficking anymore. Right. Well, quote unquote. Right. But not like the Brazilians. So a lot of Portuguese ships had American flag. They would just shift. Because then a, a ship, a British ship would see an American flag. And they'd leave it alone. Leave it alone. But it was full of, you know. Um, the conditions of of the ship mm -hmm. was something out of a horror movie. Yeah, you could smell a ship before you could see the mass of the ship poking out on in the horizon. If the wind was blowing right. towards the land, 
you can smell the putrid and smell uh, uh, the because um, you were talking about Everyone. hundreds of people chained to one another right. in places where you could not keep a, a candle lit. The lack of oxygen in the hull of a ship. You know, they were packed like sardines. They couldn't make it to a latrine to li- relieve themselves. So they were just defecating so it, it, where they defecating were. Defecating wherever where they were, uh, puking, right. you name it, right? Uh, they were moving caskets. Right, yeah. Um, uh, moving coffins, right? Torture chambers. At least yeah. there were cho- torture chambers because for weeks you're like that, right? And another detail we don't think a lot sometimes is that it was not every ship that went to Africa and landed in Africa and packed the ship with humans and then left. Right. Now they went from port to port sometimes, bidding. Bidding on them. No, 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 no. I'm not paying that much for this slave, you know. And they would chain you into the hull of a ship and and Go inch up the African coast. So sometimes oh you gosh. are in the ship way longer than the voyage across the Atlantic. Because oh. you, you're going up the coast or yeah. down the coast, depending how where you're stopping. Right. And that could be another month. Yes, just filling in because, yeah. you know, I'll buy 10 here, 15 there, 50 here, uh, you know, a half a dozen there, and then to get to 300, 400, you know. When Malaga was caught, the last time Malaga was caught, she mm-hmm. had almost 900 people. And it was, it was only, well, it should have only fit 500. Her size would have barely fit. Five, and yet there were eight hundred people on board. Right. Yeah, and so you can imagine the conditions. Right. So I did, I did a bit of research. You and couldn't I, stand up on the ship. Right. Because yeah. right, because what I found was was that you originally right when they first started doing this terrible thing, they were given a space of six feet by one and a half feet, six feet long, one and a half feet wide. And then there would be a, another person next to you. And then there'd you. be another person next to you, like, or oh, wide. Well, and behind you, and to your right, you, every, yeah, every, yeah, yeah, right, uh, right, right. surrounded, yeah. Right, so you've got six foot by one and a half feet, and this, but, this is, you know, a ship that may be 90 feet long, right? And then above you, uh, like platform. three feet above you, there would be another platform with the same. Right. And then three feet above that. Another, yeah. Another. So you couldn't stand up. Right, you could. You even could even s- sit up, right? Depending if you're tall or not, right? You know, depending which tribe you're coming from. If you're you know, a short if, back if, or a long back, right? Is, yeah. yeah. So. Oh my gosh. That's... And 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 then looking for a central character to tell the story. Right. You know, Malaga starts in Maine. Right. 1832. It's sunk by the British in 1848. Okay. So I'm like, okay. So all of a sudden, I'm like, so I'm when gonna, the ship was sunk, they were off the coast of Africa, and it would have been filled with slaves. Yes, but they did not sink her with the slaves in it. They they took the slaves. They'll take the slaves out and send them back, not necessarily to where they came from, but they will send them back. So they'll, they'll put them back, presumably to the nearest port. Right? Yes, yeah. and then and then they would send Malaga back to North America, and Malaga would end up back in Brazil, and then Malaga would start all over again, get caught again eventually, the slaves would be taken out of her hall, and yeah. then she would be, go back to him. so wow. it's, yeah, and change names, and change flags, and change this, and change that, and then finally, they shot her, and sunk her, right? Yeah. That was in the late uh, uh, 1840s, 1848. So the story goes for about 40 minutes mm-hmm. when I do it for public shows. Mm-hmm. In schools, I try to go a little shorter so that the kids have more time to ask questions afterwards. Right. You know, so, and I tell, f- the it's from the point of view of the boat. The ship, yeah. The ship tells, so I, I, I... How did you come up with that idea of like telling it from the point of view of the ship? Because I needed a central character that would carry the story all the way to the end. And the only right. one carrying the story all the way to the end of the ship was the ship itself. Right, because the captain's changed and... Yes, the captain's changed, yeah. the ship's name changed, the situation's changed. Right, right. And I'm like, so she is 
uh, the main character. Mm. And then and then to create the main character, to allow her to talk, I needed to create a folk tale like opening to the story. So the story starts with a rite of passage ritual for the trees in Maine. Oh, that's right. Yes, yes, yes. So some trees will become a church. Some right. trees will become a schoolhouse. Some trees will become a neighborhood. And Grandmother Pine looks upon them and she's the, she can see the future, Grandmother Pine. And then Grandmother Pine said, oh, I see a, an amazing future for you. You're going to travel. You're going to be a vessel. You're going to be a ship. And you're going to travel the seas of green, the seas of blue. And then she pauses and she looks very perturbed. She said, I see a lot of red too. I, d I don't know what that is. Ah, don't bother. You'll find out. Oof, jeez. Yeah. So that's how I said the story, right? right. And then she's, she, become, she starts to travel. Right. And but before that, you make the ship and there's an incredible yeah, I do piece a mine. of mine. Yes, I start to, to, to build the ship and turning. Do, yeah, I do a, you do a, a 360, 360 right. to show time going by. And, and it's also uh, showing the building of the ship. Yes, the mine, You're pulling doing, ropes right, and ropes, sawing and, and, and hammering. Right, and, yeah. And um, so effective. Um, so how did how did that? So you you say that you took this piece from an earlier piece? Yes, I do a mine piece called the Flight of Icarus. So when the wing is being built, mm -hmm. the wings that Icarus and his father. Because Icarus does not build the wings. No, his father does. His father does, right. deadless. And and so I I do this 360. And he's he's picking up the wax and, and the feathers and doing all that. And so I said, I'm going to do the passage of time by doing all these movement for the Malaga. For the Malaga, yeah. For Icarus is feathers, feathers and wax and this and that, right? Okay, wow. So I'm like, I'm going to employ that technique to do the three so I do turn my body so people listening can understand the 360s I turn my body 360 uninterruptedly uh, uh, you know I just yeah. go to, to 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 turning and when I face the audience again the ship is built the ship is built so that's the beginning and I sing a song as I'm doing it lumberjack lumber John lumber Peter well, Matthew did, too where did that song come from that came from the ship uh, I, <laughs> This sounds like kind of, you know, uh, kumbaya, you know, thing. But a lot of the ideas I had for this this story mm -hmm. came fully, I call them uploaded. They're uploaded into my conscious fully. I was driving to Indigo Arts Alliance right. where I was in residency for a month. I was an artist in residence in September, October of 2021 that's where i was building the story okay i was re researching and rehearsing and also i was mentoring another artist i was a mentor to an artist okay and also building uh, creating the ship right. and i was driving to indigo like i did every morning right. for a month that right. i was there this is during COVID. Right. another amazing thing that happened i had the, i had the month to do it I wasn't on the road, right. so I had the month to do this. And I was on the ramp, going onto the highway, on right. the ramp. And by the time I entered the ramp and I exited the ramp, I had the whole song. And um, That's so cool. Yeah. I love that one. So I do, I, yeah, yeah, magic. So I do, yeah. you know, Lumberjack, Lumber John, Lumber Peter, Matthew too. Lumber flowing down the river to the bay. You know, so that scent, that, that, phrase there lumber flowing down the river to the bay shows the movement of the trunks flowing down right. the penobscot river the kennebec river in maine that come in from the interior and bringing in the lumber to the bay to the shipbuilding you so know shipyards, which was yeah. the the shipbuilding yards were all over maine so i added that sentence all driving to rehearsal wow. and then when i got to rehearsal i sing it again and again so I decided to add Abenaki, which are the native people, right. who are also involved. You know, the, 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 uh, a, a, a lot of things that people don't understand is that Maine was very diverse back in the day. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of black people in Maine, right. uh, and they found ra uh, refuge in the maritime industry. 
Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, they would go out fishing. They would build the ships. There were black people building the ships side, side by side with white people and native people. And, um, and uh, a lot of the slave ships, some of the crew were black. There were slaves on the ship. Right. Uh, it, it's it's uh, it's it's mind boggling. And it is. Um, uh, so I tell. And so my idea to have Malaga was another idea I had. This was a conscious. It was not uploaded. This was a strategic idea. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to tell the audience the most disturbing parts of the Middle Passage. I didn't want to tell the audience like we would tell as storytellers. Right. And this happened, and that happened, and, and that's what happened. Uh, I wanted to distance the audience a little bit. I want them to uh, not to hear directly from me. Oh, okay. On stage. Right. I said, how do I deliver the really horrific details of the Middle Passage to the audience without looking at the audience? So... In one point in the story, Malaga can hear me. Because I let Malaga loose. There's, there are two or three points, aren't there? Yes. There's, so I'm like... One at the beginning, one in the middle passage, and then another part at the end. When she's about to be right. sunk, right? right? So Malaga, I, I will say, and Malaga arrived at this place, and I will talk about what, what happened. Right. And I just leave the boat alone. And then I turn to the audience and go, hey, I don't know about you, but I miss Malaga. I wonder where she's up to. to. Right, right. So I go yeah. and say, Malaga. And at one point, she's like, Malaga, who calls my name? And I'm like, whoa, you can hear Malaga? When I say Malaga, you hear me? And then, I, and then Malaga goes, and I change my arm position so people know when I'm the ship and when I am Antonio. Right. The story. And Malaga goes, who said Malaga? Can you hear me, Malaga? I'm like, I'm a storyteller. I'm telling a story here. It's 2023. I'm in a school, whatever I am, I say, I am right. in this building. Right. And she goes, I don't understand 2023. What do you mean by that? And, and I go, oh, it's just the year. Um, I'm telling a story. And then she goes, oh, you're, you're a storyteller. My grandmother was a storyteller. Grandmother Pine was a storyteller. And, and she told me there was going to be sea of red. I'm not understanding. There's a lot of red around me. What's going on here? So I tell her what's going on. She doesn't know what's going on. She's confused. Right. Because she's sold into slavery. So she's confused. Like, what the heck is going on? Why is this yeah. moaning and these people are chained up? What are they doing to them? And I'm like, oh, you're a slave ship now. Because the last time we've seen Malaga, she was not. Right. She was just moving cotton and tobacco up and down the East Coast. Right. I'm like, oh, you're a slave ship now, Malaga. That's the, the, the red you see of the sharks. And then I tell her right. with my face turned slightly sideways as I am seeing her. Right. And then she goes, what? What, is, what do you mean? Yeah. You know, uh, uh, why so they don't revolt? And I go, oh, they do revolt. There have been some recorded revolts. Uh, um, and, and, um, but three percent, I worked it out. <laughs> yeah, and then she, and so the numbers start to come out, right. and the audience is just watching this dialogue between myself, the storyteller, mm -hmm. and Malaga, the character, right? Like you do in a folk tale, right. right? So Malaga speaks, and then Malaga at the end, she wants to be the storyteller. I surrender the story to her. Yeah, she she asks for it. Right, she's like, look. Here I am again. You know, here we are talking again. And I've seen a lot. I even have learned some Portuguese. And she says, I'm a slave ship. I'm a, eu sou um navio negreiro. I say in Portuguese. She says in Portuguese. Right. I learned how to say who I am in Portuguese. So I've seen enough. You know, I can see far from up here. Because she's the whole ship, right? So right, she can right. see from the crow's nest. Crow's nest. Yeah. She's like, she's like, can you just surrender the story? Can I just finish this? Oh. It always gets me when, um, when she asks to uh, tell the story. And I think what it is, is the, uh, the subtext there is, is the, the subtext 
of her asking to tell her own story is the inability of the black people being unable to tell their own stories right yeah and it's also her claiming um claiming herself herself right yeah so there's and, um, and the so horrible the, horrible the, the thing that that was totally out of her control yeah right and, exactly and she's and, and, and she, resigns and she it. is the peril right so yeah. so it's a it became, I, I didn't think about it intellectually, the this, this strategy of having, having her tell the story mm -hmm. as, as the people listening to her story, they feel sorry for the ship. Right. So the underlying message is if you can feel sorry for an inanimate object, then you should. How about the slaves themselves? And when she's like, oh, here the, here's the British, here the, and then she goes on for quite a while on a monologue about what she has learned, right. which is all new information for the uh, audience. And then she sees a British ship and it's like, oh, here we go again. They're going to take them out and, and, and send me back to North America. They're going to take them off. Oh, they're carrying them off. Oh, some of them did not make it, you know. So I, I'm, just, I'm broadcasting from the ships, you know. The ship is telling. Yeah. They're removing, you know. And then she said, "Okay, now I'm gonna go." And then she stops, and I go, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, whoa! They're pointing cannons. They're pointing cannons at me. They've never done this. Oh, you storyteller, you knew this, huh?" <laughs> and yeah. that's the last she says. Yeah. You knew about this. You kept it quiet. She goes like that. But there's, there are also points in the story where she asks you to change the story. Yes, that's uh, that, yeah. That is... That's uh, she wants me to change the story because Grandmother Pine, yeah. when stories got too scary for us, she would change, she would change the story. And right. she, and uh, and she asks, she says, "Can you change the story?" And I said, "No, I can't tell. I can't change the story. It already, it yeah. already happened." Yeah. And, and that's a that's a powerful point of the story yeah that happens uh, early on yeah when she's first when she realizes understanding it. what's going yeah. on she's like change the story sink me can yeah. you sink me? if you can't change the story sink it right. sink me you know mm, can't do that either right not yet <laughs> well <laughs> yeah but i can't yeah. do it right right you know yeah, yeah, yeah so yeah. but i don't tell her she's gonna sink wow um, yeah um we should go back to the whole process yes. of the creation of of the story itself, um, you had the information that was given to you. You read a lot. I read a lot. I read a lot. I you read the dissertation. I read the three volumes, mm -hmm. um, and and then I'm like, what goes into the show? What doesn't go? Because one of the things I hated about history mm -hmm. was the overwhelming number of dates. Yeah, and I'm like, when I'm doing a historical piece. I don't want to overwhelm the the audience with numbers, right? Because it's it's mind boggling. So I want to do some numbers so they know some dates. I want to, you know, it's important for them to know the number of slaves, the date Malaga was created, the date Malaga sank, how many people at this date when she gets to Rio, um, how many people lived in Rio at the time. You know, I want to give them, but I didn't want to overwhelm them with dates yeah and i didn't want the story to last an hour and a half either right so some of the facts some of the facts that you share on during the story is that there there were 36,000 trips trips 36,000 trip recorded trips that is yes from right. so there were from from uh, 1500 and so uh -huh. uh to about 1860s, right. 1860s, yeah. And, and of those 36,000 trips, there were only 300 revolts. 600 revolts, recorded revolts. Was it 600? Yes. Okay, all right. 600, uh, about 25 along the American coast. Right. The others closer to uh, Africa. And, um, and I say, you know... Uh, so oh, how did they revolt? I mean, they were all chained up. Yes, they were brought up to for meals and oh. to check up to see how they were doing health-wise and stuff. 
they were, they were um, brought up on deck. Okay. So most of the revolts happened um, um, near the coast. They could still see Africa. Okay. And they'll revolt and sail the ship back, to find a way to bring the ship back, even though a lot of them did not have the know-how, but they would just do it, hold somebody at yeah. gunpoint, whatever. Yeah. But the revolts would happen because, um, you know, there are a lot of them. And if they found a way to to grab somebody to do something, they, they revolted. Right. You know, um, there are many different ways of, of doing that. I don't know it in detail. Right. You know, but um, the, the, the Amistad, there was a revolt. They, they, they freed themselves enough to overcome them. To overcome them. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, if they if they sensed a revolt turning, if they sensed some danger, um, the crew mm -hmm. they would decapitate one of them, one of the slaves, and hoist it up while they're still in port. Sometimes, because remember they would kind of just go port by port right. buying slaves. So if they sensed danger, um, they would uh, hoist up somebody headless up. And, and bring other ships to see the body because a lot of them believe that once your head is lost, your soul would be lost forever. Oh my gosh. So they did that. Holy cow. So they did that to um, to tame, right? to keep them under fear. Right. Of uh, Because one thing was to die. Worse than dying was to have your head cut off. For not all the tribes believed in that, but some of the tribes that they were uh, had that belief system, right? Wow. So that that makes me think of another story, which comes from Africa: the severed head. No, I'm, I'm, it's a it's a jump story. Oh, the talking skull. The talking skull. Yeah. Yeah. The talking, the talking head, skull, When they yeah, find yeah. a, to a yeah, head yeah, 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 on yeah. a tree stump, and they're like, mm -hmm. oh. Who did this to you? So yeah, yeah. that adds backstory to that. Well, it, yeah, yeah, I think because that would be the worst kind of it's, it's, yes situation. Yeah, of course. yeah, that's in, yeah, yeah, yeah. There could wow. be a connection there. Yeah. There could be. I'm not sure, but yes, right. Um, um, that's, that's yeah. The brutality of the whole thing is just oh, it was very brutal, right. very brutal. Um, there is a huge amounts of fear of revolt, especially after Haiti became a country. Haiti was, it was, what, early, late, late uh, 1800s, almost, not, uh, no, late 1700s, mm -hmm. when the Haitians uh, took control of, of um, the slaves there. It was right after the French Revolution, oh, right? Right. And they became a free nation. They became a, they, they were the first group of slaves to Take control and become a independent nation. Yeah, eighteen oh four. You see, right? Yeah, because the, the revolution it started in seventeen ninety one. Ninety one, and right. then in eighteen oh four, the Haitians take control. Right. And um, it, but it did not. One Jeez, thing that, that's a long revolution. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so after that. The they they they, well. they went up on punishment, wow. uh, all over the Americas. They were afraid that that could happen somewhere else, and there are many uh, there are many revolutions in Brazil. A lot of escapes, and and they became quilombos. Quilombo is a word. It's the they would hide in 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 create small communities oh, okay. uh, away from anybody else. They're called quilombos, and. Um, and uh, and the punishment went to a point that it was so severe that um, the death rate was huge. They would beat you, and 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 you die from the consequences. And um, you know you're talking about fifty slashes, seventy slashes. Yeah. And the whips were braided, right. and there are several ends, right. and their each end was braided. So it would, it's, it's, it would take slice. flesh, slice yeah. flesh yeah. off your back. Yeah. And then for fear that you develop an infection, they would put in, you know, pepper, salt, vinegar. Oh, my God. Yeah. But uh, 
so that's the story. That's the story. It's, um, in my opinion, I can only speak for myself because I know my repertoire. Right. And, and I, I know for all these 30 years I've been telling stories, uh, 20 plus years now. I started in as I, speaking because I was doing mind stories before. Right. Right. Uh, I've been doing that for over 34 years. Okay. But when I start gathering repertoire that was spoken, this is my most important piece. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. Um, poetically, very poetically uh, um, uh, in its delivery. Uh, and there's a lot of pathos, mm. you know, the there ship yeah. telling the story the sound effects um, I create and um, the movement of the ship, the creation of the ship, the moaning and the crying of the slaves, the uh, all the historical, um, you yeah. know, and she is, um, she's quite the character. She is. And, uh, she's an amazing character. It's exciting and I appreciate you spending time creating this podcast ah, no when I when, when I heard you know when you first started telling myself and a few other close colleagues of ours what you were doing the first thing that I thought was when this is done we need to sit down and talk about the whole process <laughs> yeah you told me that yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah that, it's, it's such an important story to be told yeah. I think and it was a very cathartic process because it's my first slave piece right I really had to face my fears right I did my DNA my patriarchal African ancestry mm -hmm. DNA and I come from the Kota and the Benga people located in today Gabon so that's where my folks come from wow my slave ancestry. And for those, those that don't know the geography of Africa? That's West Africa. It's right there. You know, there's the West Africa. Right. The big which, bump that sticks out. That sticks west uh, west into right. the Atlantic. Right. And then it kind of goes in. Right. Right there by uh, Cameroon. Right. And then, then uh, you have um, Gabon. It's soon after there. Okay. On West Africa. So if, if we compare it... Center. To it would be the northeast of Brazil right. area. Yeah. Yeah. And it, uh, yeah, so you can see how. Yeah. So that's where I come from. So this, sh this ship story has been amazing. It, uh, creating it, it was, it was mind boggling. The amount of f fear I had to overcome and anger. Yeah. The anger that surfaced, yeah. it was, it was, uh, uh, beyond me anger it was ancestral right it was ancestral it was stuff that is that had been bottled up in me that was not just from my birth to now but from your ancestors my ancestors yeah and and uh and and it's interesting how i became a much calmer person after this story was premiered um, I, I don't get worked up. I used to get very worked up very easily about stuff. Um, uh, not in public, right. you know, uh, but uh, and even my wife says, you know, you've become a much more like relaxed person after uh, 2018, actually. 2018, I started to deal with my fear in a way I had never dealt before. Right. And so I had some uh, issues with fear and anxiety and it was all in preparations to start creating the story. If I hadn't cleaned that slate, right. I wouldn't have had the wherewithal to even tackle the story, let alone right. yeah. tell it. Right. So it, so it was eight, 19, uh, 2018, 2019, I started to like, okay, I want to tell a story about a ship, right? right? And then the story lands on my lap in 2020. 2021, I premiere it, and then I get booked by Port Innovations, which has been godsend. Port Innovations, the premier performing art organization in Portland. Right. They big, What's, they bring big shows, Broadway shows. You know, they are now. It's probably with, one of the premier event um, venues in Maine, isn't it? 
organizations. Yeah, yeah they yeah. yeah they bring Broadway shows and musicals and dance companies and all. Right. And but they have a new, uh, they have a um, educational department right. that brings shows to schools and brings schools to shows. So Malaga is being offered this year, and I've got a ton of bookings through them, and one which blew me away. You can't make this stuff up. There's a church in Brunswick where the boat was built. Right. That the people, the leaders of the church, start to discover that the, one of the founders of the church was also involved with slavery, building slave ships. And one of them was called Malaga. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so they start to research the involvement of Joseph Badger of right. Brunswick, Maine, with slavery, and they come up on the page of Portland Ovations about the Malaga show that I'm doing, and they book the show. And I go to the church, and I tell the story in the church to a packed church. They gave one of the longest standing ovations of my career. And at the whole time I'm telling the story, the ceiling of the nave, it's a ship upside down. It's the hull of a ship. So you're in a church built by the guy who built Malaga and inside the ship in a way because the ceiling of the yeah. nave is the hull of a ship wow. upside down and uh, how did that feel it was incredible it was incredible uh, and th th then they donated thousands of dollars as scholarship so I can do the story in schools uh, and offer them a scholarship for the fee. So they're fully invested in this story being told as many times as possible. Um, and uh, and the money has been all booked up already because people are booking and some schools, they said, oh, that's, you know, can we have some funding? And like, oh yeah, we have funding for it. Thanks to this church, um, mm -hmm. St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Brunswick, Maine. Um, and it's, so the universe is celebrating the story. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's, yeah. it's incredible. And people are not ticked off. They're not, as, they're not upset. I thought people were going to get upset, that people are going to leave. And, but they know what they're walking into. I right. don't blame anybody for it. There's no, you know, that's part of the show is to also um, make people understand this is what happened. Right. There's this history mm -hmm. that's being uncovered. You know, that New England was not this passive slave free. Uh, there were actually slaves here as well. Mm -hmm. But anyway, long story short, it's not about being embarrassed or being ashamed of your ancestors. It's understanding that this was an industry, everybody was involved. Mm -hmm. You couldn't get away from it. You couldn't get away from it. There were people who were fighting against it. Right. So you, you could get away from it. Some people did it on purpose, and they're conscious, and, and they're doing it because they're making money with it. Right. But it's, it's not because your great, 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 great somebody mm -hmm. was involved in it that you should feel embarrassed for it because you are not the one doing it. Right. But it's important that you know it happened right. so you're not in this fog Right. of history that you're like, oh, no, no nothing happened. Yeah. Yes, it did happen. Yes. It and, did. It, and we should know about it. So yeah. we, yeah. we are well educated. Right. And we're not going to... Well, I think that a lot of this kind of, this kind of history, yeah. if it's not talked about, it festers. It festers. Right. It's like a wound. You just keep scratching at it. But when you actually say, this is what happened, then there's, healing can start. To take place. absolutely it's like and, what Germany is doing with the Holocaust right right it's part of the curriculum in schools right there are museums everywhere right um, and uh, there are memorials everywhere mm -hmm. so the new generation of Germans they know there are a lot of their ancestors were Nazis right you know yeah. but they're like hey we're not Nazis now we're not Nazis now and we're gonna do the best we can uh, to make sure uh, you know, even happen. though there's neo yeah, fascism yeah. everywhere in the world, but yeah. at least you know, there's people are bringing it to light. You mm -hmm. cannot heal anything unless light comes to it, right? Right, and it's through the cracks of history yes. and trauma yeah. that the light can come 
in. Right. And it's through the cracks. If there are no cracks, you can't heal. Right. So trauma is also a way to heal something deeper. Right? Because we are we are as a species, we're moving towards healing. We always try to do something better, right? Although it doesn't look that way. <laughs> but uh, but it, it, we're always, there's always a group of people working it to, to make things better, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And trauma happens and you can either suffer from it or you can use it as a tool, as, as a tool right. for healing, you know? So that's, I've been, I know, I can speak for myself, working on this piece and telling it has been a great healing journey for me in a way that I couldn't, I could never have imagined. Could never have imagined. Just, just the fear that went away, it's, it's incredible. Wow. You know, there's always this angst. There's always this angst that I always saw it. I knew it was there mm -hmm. and I could never do anything about it. And then it, it, it dissipated, not completely, uh, but well, it wouldn't be you if you didn't have a little bit of angst. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so you have, so you have a lot of. Uh, I have a different relationship with it now. Let's put it that yeah. way. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, and Malaga has been a great healer and a great companion, and I'm very honored to be able to tell her story. Thank you for sharing it. You're welcome. <laughs> Wow, a lot to think about. Well, there is a lot to think about. I feel that I'm fairly well read about slavery, but I learn more and more with every encounter with the subject, history and heartbreak. I cannot hope that you enjoyed this episode, but I hope you were enlightened and learned from it. And maybe you want to bring Antonio to tell the slave ship Malaga in your community. It is a moving piece of art that Antonio has created. Be sure to check out other episodes. If you need a lift after this one and have not heard the conversation with Joel Ben Izzy, go and check that episode out. It's a lot of fun. You can find me and my work on Facebook, Simon Brooks Storyteller, on my website, simonbrooksstoryteller.com, and on Instagram, Simon M. Brooks. Diamond Scree? Yep, that's me, the English fella and storyteller. A shout out goes to Chris Jed for creating and recording and letting me use this wonderful music which he created for my podcast. His band is called Blackpool Mecca. You can help this podcast, keeping it alive, by supporting my craft and becoming one of my Patreons and paying anything from a dollar for an episode you might have enjoyed to a regular monthly subscription. In return, you get extras, early releases and exclusive content on my work www.patreon.com forward slash Simon Brooks If you can't join my wonderful tribe of patrons then help me out by doing something you can do I would be very grateful if you were to leave a review on Podbean, Stitcher, Apple Podcast wherever you found this episode It won't take long and it helps not just me but others find and enjoy this podcast Thanks again for being here with me I know there are a lot of other places you could be so I appreciate it Until next time be healthy be happy and share the stories you love. Cheers. It's just a story. <laughs> <laughs>